Now is the um, session on administration of justice and legal administration. I'd like to welcome the uh, Secretary for uh, Justice and also the Judiciary Administrator and their teams. So I'll invite uh, the Secretary for Justice to make an opening statement, and then the Judiciary Administrator will be invited to speak before the floor is open to questions and answers. So, Secretary for Justice, yes, uh, Chairman and members. For 2015 and 16, the total estimated expenditure of the Department of Justice is, 19, uh, is 1980 million dollars, which involves an increase of 14.8 percent over the revised estimated uh, expenditure of 2014 and 15, i.e., 254.7 million dollars. This increase is partly due to the filling of vacancies which could not be filled previously and the net creation of eight posts to cope with the increasing demand of government departments for legal services. We also expect an increase in court costs and briefing up fees payable to barristers, solicitors and other professionals such as expert witnesses in private practice and hence have made a provision of $432 million and $500 30 million dollars respectively in 2015 and 16 for providing the necessary support for anticipated legal proceedings and related matters. The expenditure on court costs and briefing out depends on the number of the cases involved, their complexity and development. The estimated expenditure for 2015 and 16 was worked out on the information available at the time of preparing the estimates. The ultimate actual amount of expenditure will depend on the development and outcome of the cases concerned. These factors are not within the control of the government nor the DOJ. However, we will strive to exercise maximum prudence in controlling the relevant expenditure subject to the overriding principle. Sorry, uh, Secretary. Well, as uh, all members have already got the script of your speech, so can you be more precise so that more time can be left to members to ask questions? All right. Next, uh, in fact, in the paper, we have already um, set out um, the various program areas, including prosecutions, uh, civil, legal policy, law drafting, and the international law division. So I've already set out um, the um, uh, brief work plans for the coming year. So. Um, Without further ado, maybe uh, I'll finish here so that uh, more time can be given to members to ask questions. Now, um, I'll invite the Judiciary Administrator to uh, say a few words to us. So please be brief and concise. Thank you, uh, Chairman. In 2015-16, the budget applied for by the um, Judiciary uh, amounts to uh, $1,437.2 million. In my uh, statement, I've already set out the uh, details. So I'll just uh, highlight a few points concerning judicial manpower. During the past three years, uh, uh, we have um, run uh, many recruitment exercises and some 58 appointments have been made. But then there is one point as the uh, CFA Chief Justice at the opening of the legal year in 2015, he also referred to this. Well, all in all, um, the overall recruitment progress has been quite smooth, but then uh, as far as um, the recru recruitment uh, at the level of uh, C CFI in the High Court, there were some problems. So I've already uh, extracted uh, his speech in the paper. So in meeting the challenges in 2015-16, we will continue to um, complete the recruitment exercise that we started in December last year. We will also be conducting a series of review to respond to the uh, difficulties in recruitment. This would include uh, the retirement HR of uh, judges and also the um, terms and conditions of service uh, for judicial officers. Certainly, um, in the near term, we will also be appointing deputy judges uh, in order to cope with the uh, work demand. And then uh, we've also increased the um, non-judicial post by 52, and we've already uh, justified the needs here. But then one of the posts would be a directorate grade, that is uh, an AOSGC post, and uh, we, we propose to create this post. First of all, it's for three years, and it's to provide support uh, to the judiciary because there are a, lot, a number of tasks 
that would involve um, amendments to the law. So we will have to strengthen the support for this. So later on, we'll be consulting the panel on this post before we submit our request uh, to the ESC and then to the FC. Thank you. All right, we have um, about a dozen uh, members who have uh, indicated uh, that uh, they will ask questions. So four minutes each. First, uh, Dennis Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. Last time at the um, meeting held on the 26th of uh, January, um, uh, that is the AJLS, um, AJLS panel, I was asking about uh, the progress of the Donald Zhang case. And um, the principal uh, prosecutor told me that uh, very shortly they'll make a decision, but then two months have elapsed. And yet we haven't heard or seen any decision. So in this regard, can I ask the official to respond to this? Because in the opening statement, he refers to um, prosecutions relating to the Occupy movement. But what about other prosecution issues that the, the public are concerned? And also uh, on SJ026, it's about um, the bilateral um, uh, surrender agreement. But then uh, I can see that the reply is very strange because uh, you said that, uh, well, the de details cannot be disclosed right now. You said that twice. But then we have had um, um, bilateral uh, agreements with different jurisdictions um, in the past. So why are you keeping this uh, confidential? Why can you why can you not disclose it? Because the discussion has uh, been going on for some time, and still we haven't seen any outcome. So are there any uh, reasons? So can you tell us more? Thank you, Mr. Kwok. On part A, or part one of your question, it's about uh, the complaint against uh, Mr. Donald Zhang. Well, I can see that uh, I can say that uh, the case is already at its final stage. But then there are two aspects of issues that have to be resolved. One is a, te a legal technical issue. Another one has to do with uh, uh, collecting evidence uh, from uh, overseas, and that still has not been resolved. But then I can see that I can say that we have already entered the final stage, and very shortly we'll be making a decision. Next is about uh, the uh, the bilateral uh, extradition agreement with Macau. Well, I'm afraid uh, the honourable member might not be um, entirely familiar with the procedures because uh, before and after 1997, with different jurisdictions, we have had uh, similar arrangements. But then every time in the negotiation process, the general practice is that uh, the details would not be disclosed. Concerning the bilateral agreement between Hong Kong and Macau, what I can say to the chairman and members is that the relevant draft has already reached a stage whereby both sides can um, agree on it. But then. There are some technical issues that have yet to be resolved. And concerning this agreement with Macau, we cannot um, compare that uh, with other agreements that uh, Hong Kong has signed with other jurisdictions, because this is the first time that uh, the two SARs has come to this agreement. So it's not like uh, the earlier agreements between Hong Kong and other jurisdictions. That's why there are different considerations. And I'm sure members would understand that Hong Kong and Macau are both SARs. And legally speaking, our legal system is different. But then, as I said, the relevant draft is already nearing uh, finalization, but then there are some textual and uh, technical issues that have to be dealt with. This year, um, at the working level, and I've also had meetings uh, with my counterparts in Macau, and I'm sure you must have uh, seen uh, re relevant reports are in the press already. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Sin Chong Kai. Chairman, I noticed that uh, in terms of uh, criminal prosecution, the uh, estimates, uh, what you've asked for an increase when compared to 2014-15, there was an increase by about 23%. And when compared to 2012 and 13, there was uh, an increase by some uh, 32%. And in 2013-14, you asked for some $538 million. 
So you asked for five hundred thirty million dollars, and then in twenty fourteen fifteen, original estimate was five hundred seventy seven million. Now it's been revised to six hundred and fifty nine million dollars. But then for the funding you asked for this year is seven hundred eleven million dollars. When compared to uh, twenty thirteen fourteen, there was an increase by thirty two point one percent. Bureau Direct uh, Secretary, in your statement you said that in twenty fourteen fifteen. Or 2015 16, you expect that uh, for the prosecution relating to the earlier Occupy movement would make up for a very substantial part of your funding or spending. So, are you trying to settle the score after the event? All right, uh, uh, Andy Zhang, the Commissioner for Police, also said that, uh, well, this year uh, is a record low in terms of crime figures. So, in terms of crime figures, it's uh, a record low. But then, when you ask for uh, funding, you're actually increasing that by some 23%. So can you explain that further? Because uh, uh, what well, you have not explained that uh, in detail in your statement. Thank you, Mr. Singh, for your question. I think the two cannot be uh, uh, mentioned in the same press. In dealing with uh, criminal prosecution, well, the criminal prosecution division does not just uh, have to deal with um, um, law and order situation, as well as the recent Occupy movement, there are also some major cases which have to be dealt with. For example, recently we just dealt with the former uh, chief secretary for administration, and just after that there would be appeals and a few more cases which are of high significance, and therefore both in terms of internal resources and also uh, uh, the briefing out uh, of barristers and so on, that would also incur very substantial expenditure. And as you have noticed, we also have to deal with the recent Occupy movement. I do not agree with what the Honourable Member just said. He said that uh, it's a settlement of a score after the incident. If there are any criminal elements, the police have the duty to investigate and after the police have passed on the um, investigation results to the DFJ. We have the responsibility to see if the incident involves any criminal elements. And if there is no criminal element, then uh, it would not have come to our attention. And therefore, there is no question of settling the score after the incident, so to speak. And we have acted in strict accordance with the prosecution code. And we also look at the evidence available, um, if, and we also uh, abide by the law in deciding whether or not prosecution would be taken out, and that's why the description that you used uh, was not entirely fair to our colleagues. But then for 2015-16, you increased the spending by some 32%. How much of that has to do with the Occupy movement? Chairman, well, actually we have already given a written reply earlier on. There is no such distinction, and that's why, sorry, I'm not able to give you a reply. So on what basis are you going to increase that by such a substantial margin? Because uh, if you look at um, the increase in this regard, uh, it is increasing uh, a lot more than the other areas. The, criminal, the prosecution division and our colleagues would be looking at the, the information available to us in making the estimates. But then it might involve some sensitive issues relating to those cases and also some um, uh, professional um, uh, privilege uh, materials. That's why, sorry, I cannot disclose the details here. Uh, Priscilla Lang, my question is um, SJ032. And um, because of the Occupy movement last year, there are a lot more cases to be dealt with. And uh, in fact, I've said it um, in emotion debate today. If you look at some liberal studies uh, textbook, when it comes to the issue of the rule of law, they would often say that uh, if those people think that um, um, the law is not just, then they would immediately jump to the next step of uh, um, civil disobedience. So I was just uh, reading up from the textbook, and therefore students would be reading that. And even for the teachers, they would also be relying on such textbooks, because not every teacher has a legal background. So under these circumstances, I'd like to ask, given the fact that um, there is uh, such a confusion about uh, the rule of law, and last year, Benny Tai 
um, set in, in a very high profile manner that uh, after uh, the movement, so long as they can uh, turn themselves up, uh, it's okay. It would not be uh, undermining the rule of law. So has the uh, D of J apply for funding so as to uh, counter such uh, efforts so that uh, for youngsters and also at schools when they discuss the issue of the rule of law, they would not have this uh, lopsided view so that uh, they would be able to look at uh, the two sides of the coin. I believe the DOJ has a major role to play in this, so I'd like you to be more specific. Do you do something this year? I have read a questionnaire survey supposedly from the Education Bureau. Um, I found it on the Internet, and it was a game for us to play with, teaching the basic law and also the rule of law. There was a multiple choice survey. The main points were not carried. And all the main points that should be dealt with are not there. It is just like rote learning. That way, the public will not be interested in the basic law at all. So could there be people from, with legal background, meaning uh, the DOJ, which can help to also educate the public in this regard? SJ, thank you, Ms. Leung, for your question. Promoting the rule of law and the relevant concepts have always been part of our work, and uh, this is also one of our major concerns. In the coming year, whether it be because of the recent Occupy movement or other relevant issues, we are going to roll out a series of activities to promote the concept of the rule of law. And I can give you an example. We will continue to maintain the prosecution week that is done every year by the prosecution's division to introduce our prosecution work and also our criminal justice system. Also, we are going to add something this year. In our paper, you will see this, that we are going to have the Meet the Community program. The purpose is to enhance the people's understanding of the criminal justice system and our prosecution work. At the same time, we are thinking of uh, producing APIs and also pamphlets so as to promote uh, the awareness about the rule of law amongst the public. And also, as usual, if there are community activities or talks that have to do with the promotion of the concept of the rule of law, and if the DOJ has resources and uh, work permitting, we will be happy to support that. Chairman, i just like the DOJ to be more proactive. I think they have heard you. Mr. Tem Yu Chong. 041. I asked this question. I talked about the 79 days illegal Occupy movement, which has ended, and many people have uh, broken the law. They um, disrupted social order and the uh, police have investigated cases, and in the end, these cases will go to the prosecution division, and there may be an increase in the workload. In the reply, you have said that you have uh, had a provision of $18 million to tackle the relevant expenses because you expect a big workload, and you have to um, meet briefing out expenditure to the tune of $18 million. My question for you is, is that amount of money enough? I'm sometimes worried that because of um, the big workload and the pressure and also a, a limit of the manpower you can use and maybe there could be omissions or errors. In other words, you may uh, prosecute with the wrong charge, making use of the wrong ordinance, and in the end at the court, the um, person prosecuted will be released. It's just like um, the police will arrest people and the court will set them free. I think the responsibility lies with the prosecution division. How can you ensure that your work will be correctly done and also will the provision mentioned here be enough? SJ, thank you for the question. This figure 
has been put together according to the information at hand when we uh, did the estimates. The prosecution division is reviewing the situation after we have put together the estimates. We are still looking at the number of cases and the complexity involved. If it is discovered that we need more resources, then within the DOJ will try to see whether there can be inter internal deployment of funds. If not, we will take measures to apply for more resources. All in all, in tackling cases involving social order, we have already set up a dedicated group within the prosecution division, uh, whether it be about cases um, involving social order during the Occupy movement or other cases, that uh, dedicated group will be looking at those cases. We will try our best to tackle every case very carefully by looking at the relevant evidence and to avoid uh, what Mr. Tam pictured, and that is because of web pressure, we may um, charge people with the wrong offenses. Mr. Tam, please rest assured that our colleagues will do their very best uh, not to commit any mistakes and two, that we would uh, even do better than uh, what we are doing. Thank you. Next one, Albert Ho. Thank you. Just now, the SJ in answering Mr. Sin Chong Kai mentioned that uh, there is a jump of 32 percent in terms of prosecution expenses. Uh, that is on top of 2014-15. That is a big jump. In your speech, you said that um, the Occupy Movement prosecution will take up a major part of your work this year. When you were asked for details, you refused to divulge them. We understand you are investigating into some major cases, and we don't know when decisions will be made about those major cases. Mr. Dennis Kwok mentioned one case. He has uh, pursued that case many times. And also, we were talking about uh, other cases. Uh, for example, the one involving um, Barry Cheung. So maybe you have many major cases in your mind, but you don't want to talk about them in public because you say they are sensitive. My question for you is, if indeed there are many cases uh, which have to do with the Occupy movement, you have got uh, briefing out expenses, you will also put aside um, legal professionals uh, who will have to attend to these cases. But uh, as I was saying, uh, these are civil disobedience cases, and many people will just admit their guilt in court. So the cases may not drag on for long. If you are logical, my question for you is, if you are going to use such expenses for litigation, how would that um, affect the listing of cases at court? You also have to think about that because you should not just increase expenditure for prosecution because you also have to add to the number of judges and also uh, legal aid uh, because if there are many cases, uh, some people may apply for legal aid. And also, if there are major cases, for example, last year, there was this mega case involving a high-ranking official, a former one, who was convicted. You will particularly apply for funds here. I remember you were asking for $100 million more. So if there are major cases, you should come here for specific additional funding instead of just relying on your estimation. SJ, thank you, Chairman and uh, Mr. Ho, for your question. As I was a answering another question, the present estimate uh, was formulated according to the information when we had, uh, when we put together the estimates. To avoid misunderstanding, the overall increase, um, if I may ask you to look at 100 and, uh, page 163, the increase is 7.9 percent. Mr. Ho asked uh, two questions. He said the Occupy movement involves uh, civil disobedience and maybe many people will just admit their guilt at court. I don't know about that at this stage. And when we do the estimates, we cannot project 
that um, everybody will admit their guilt. Well, at least up to today, what we see is not that everyone admits their guilt. Uh, we have seen many people pleading not guilty. Some people said they would plead guilty, but in the end, they would ask the police to conduct their own investigation. So would that really come to pass? We, we have uh, to keep the situation under observation. Also, Mr. Ho asked about the listing of cases and whether there will be an impact on other units, including the legal aid department and also the workload of judges. When we consider how to tackle Occupy Movement cases, first of all, we have to look at the law, the evidence, and also the overall interest of Hong Kong, including how the civil or the judiciary will be affected. But at the same time, we cannot tolerate the situation where we will not act against uh, illegal acts in Hong Kong. Therefore, there is a plethora of factors for consideration, and then we have to strike a balance amongst them. Ms. Sitho? Uh, my mic is on. Thank you. I'd like to follow up my question. SJ020. I have been asking this question of every department because in the 10 odd months before, we have seen that sometimes departments would enter into agreements with the mainland and sometimes you have to amend the laws in uh, maybe sometimes it's just the schedule. But then actually you say there are no meeting minutes after those meetings. And when we asked you, you said that it was too technical. And then in the end, local laws have to be amended. And yet you had no minutes about those meetings. I am very uh, suspicious about such mainland Hong Kong exchange. In other words, things would be worked out in uh, the dark. And then in the end, uh, internal governance of Hong Kong would be affected. Therefore, in SJ020, I asked this question about departments and their visits, exchanges, and meetings with the mainland for the past five financial years, and whether there have been records, and if not, why not? I have asked for a tabulated form uh, of answer, and when you answer my question, you did not actually address my question. If you duck the question more, there will be more suspicion in the minds of the public. Uh, is that just an omission? or? Do you intend to answer my question? Or is it that these meetings are just um, exchanges over meals or visits to certain places instead of actual meetings? If you are accountable to the legislature, you should answer our questions direct. Why is it that I raised the question and then you did not address it? SJ. Thank you, Chairman. And the question. Maybe there is some misunderstanding here. Actually, in the answer, we mentioned the relevant matters. If Ms. Ho would look at the reply, line three, it says, professional exchanges and promotional activities on arbitration and legal services of Hong Kong, and it would depend on the nature of the exchanges and the level of representation at the events. In other words, it depends whether it was just a, a cordial visit or whether it was an exchange to tackle technical problems. Now, of course, it is, if it's just a, a cordial visit, there may not be meeting minutes. But if uh, there are important meetings, of course there are records. But uh, do you keep them? Do you keep the records? If there are records, of course they are kept. Then you have to answer it that way. I have given you a table form, say uh, 2010 to 11, 13 times. Out of these 13 times, how many were just cordial visits? How many were technical meetings? But you just used a column purposes of visit to cover 70 or 66 such exchanges over the past five years. Is that the way you should be accountable to this council? I was asking for each and every visit, since you also said that some were technical meetings, some were just cordial visits. Would you mind supplementing information to tell us about each and every visit? SJ, 
Thank you for the question. We'll have to go back and do follow up because some meetings may be technical or may be sensitive in nature, but we will try our very best to give you the information. This is exactly what I'm driving at. How many such meetings are sensitive in nature so that Hong Kong people did not know about them so that there were no records kept about them? This is exactly what I was driving at, but you ducked the issue. Well, what, um, well, well, if sensitive issues are discussed, it doesn't necessarily mean that there would be no records. So that's not what we said. So we are not trying to duck or avoid uh, coming up with uh, any records. That's why we do not keep such records. So there is no question of the um, D of J doing this. Next. Uh, you can uh, provide the information later. Yes, Claudia Mo. Thank you, Chairman. Secretary, as the S for J, you should know that um, everybody is equal before the law. When it comes to Donald Zhang's case, so you should not have uh, said it deliberately. You should not have called him Mr. Donald Zhang deliberately because you're giving people the impression that you're actually uh, differentiating between friends and foes. But then still, I'd like to ask this. You often said that, uh, well, investigation and also the uh, legal procedures are already at the final stage. That's why very shortly you come up with some new progress. So what does that mean? So is it before the summer or before the summer break? So is that what you meant by uh, coming up with a, with a decision shortly? That's my first question. My second question is SJ33. Just now, um, as Ms. Sito said, there was no meeting records. You said that it's just a courtesy call. That's why there would be no minutes or records. So it's up to you to define what's uh, a courtesy call, what's a technical meeting. And you said that uh, if there are minutes of meeting, then you would be keeping that um, as records. But then in Hong Kong, we still do not have the archive law. That's why I'm asking you, with regard to the disclosure of, in of information and also with regard to the keeping of records. So. Well, on the study on the archive law, so what progress has been made? All right, on the disclosure of inter or access to information, still you have a code, yet it's not legally binding. And uh, you can always say that uh, it's sensitive. So whatever, whichever department you approach, so they can always say that, uh, well, they would not be disclosing that to you on basis of confidentiality. So it's not just uh, for reporters. So for anybody trying to solicit information, then you can always say that uh, you, you would not be disclosing that on basis of confidentiality. You said that uh, you have pre kept records. What a, well, according to the calculation, the height of the um, files should have been taller than the height of um, IFC. All right, for the Lerma um, collision incident, we all know that uh, it's very difficult to find out um, the um, files as to which party has done water on a particular date and what's the conclusion and so on. So for how long have we talked about this? Starting from 2012, we've been saying this. And of course, you said that uh, you have set up that committee for less than a year. But then in your reply, you said that uh, the two subcommittees are now working very hard. So you said that uh, the two Subcommittees have been working very hard, so apparently they are meeting for 25 hours a day, and then in due course they would be giving an account to you, so they'll get back to you. But then this is not the right way to communicate uh, between the executive and the legislature. Honestly, well, uh, if there are preliminary recommendations and then reform proposals, then the LRC would be given a final report. So at what stage are you now? Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Mo, for your question. First of all, I do not understand that at a meeting of this council, when I try to address someone as a um, gentleman uh, by calling him a Mr. Blah, so I would always address members as the honourable member. So what's wrong with that? So please do not be overly sensitive about such uh, addresses. All right, on the archive law. So you said that uh, that would be done very expeditiously. Would that be before the summer? Well, at least there are two parts as to whether or not that will be done uh, before summer. Sorry, at this uh, stage, I'm not able to disclose the timing of that. But then we fully understand that in the community, there are extensive concerns about this. But then as the relevant situation is still progressing, 
so it's not appropriate for me to disclose the timing of that. But then I can only say that it's already at the final stage. So, Chairman, uh, with your permission, I'd like to answer the second part of Ms. Mo's question. Please be brief. Yes, I'll try my best. Well, Ms. Mo said that in our reply, it's not a good way to facilitate the communication between the executive and the legislature. I'd like to clarify that what well, the whole thing is we try to be neutral. That's why we have passed this on to the Law Reform Commission and the LRC is a neutral body. And the LRC has set up a subcommittee and uh, is dealing with um, the archives law and also the subcommittee on access to information. So both committees have been meeting uh, regularly, almost on a monthly basis. So there is no question of them not working hard. And I also hope that this council and the community would understand that the study that is being conducted by the two subcommittees, well, they are not just looking at the local scenario. They are also making a comparison with other jurisdictions. And I believe that uh, if you're also concerned about the practice elsewhere, in coming up with um, an archives law, so that would um, take more than a year. Yes, Ms. Emily Lop, thank you, Chairman. I would also like to ask about uh, Donald, Mr. Donald Zhang and Mr. Timothy Tong, as well as Mr. Barry Zhang. So, what's what's happening with regard to those cases? Well, on um, on Wednesday, we have already asked. Uh, about the case involving Barry Cheung, and uh, apparently um, the case is still with the SFC. So when will prosecution be taken out? So throughout the whole process, uh, it would involve the D of J colleagues. So it's not about them uh, completing a report, and then you would decide if you'd like to prosecute. So you've been following up um, in, throughout the process. So for such sensitive cases, and there are individuals who are so close to the chief executive. So would you be briefing that out uh, and uh, get independent uh, legal advice? And also for the uh, operations review committee, all right, uh, the chair is going to be taken up by Maria Tam, who's uh, an NPC uh, delegate. And we all know that uh, for uh, uh, human rights and also the rule of law index, uh, we are coming down, and people would always uh, say that, well, let's see what the uh, Secretary for Justice is going to do. So what is going to happen to these individuals? And all right, you're talking to the, uh, to the gentleman behind you, so why don't you just ask him to respond? But well, last time, the Commissioner told us that uh, they would be acting as quickly as possible, but how come nothing has happened so far? So who is to answer the question? Yes, uh, Secretary. Thank you, Ms. Lau, for your question. First. Um, as far as investigation of such cases are, is concerned, um, well, in simple terms, there are two um, scenarios. First, um, in the course of investigation, if the relevant uh, uh, institution encounters uh, any difficulties, um, then they would uh, refer to the uh, DFJ for legal advice. Ms. Lau, you mentioned the case involving Barry Zhang. In the course of investigation, of course, it's not for me to disclose whether it's now with the SFC or the police. But then, whenever there is um, any legal issue arising in the course of investigation, they would uh, refer to the DFJ for advice. Similarly, in the cases involving Mr. Donald Zhang and Mr. Timothy Tong, that also happened. So, when the relevant law enforcement agency is of the view that uh, they've already completed uh, the investigation, then the relevant files and information would be passed on to the DFJ. And then if the prosecution's division thinks that um, there is sufficient evidence, then we will take up prosecution. And if there is not enough, there is not sufficient evidence, then we will, uh, continue, we will ask the relevant bodies to conduct further investigation. As to the three cases that you referred to just now, two cases involve sensitive figures um, in the views of the Public. In particular, one case uh, involves uh, uh, our former chief executive, Mr. Donald Trump, whether or not we have engaged uh, outside uh, council to look into this case. Yes, we do have uh, a Queen's Council um, overseas, and we have sought his independent legal advice. And the consideration 
is similar to what Ms. Emily Lau just said. That is, we understand the uh, widespread concerns in the community about this case. That's why we have deliberately engaged uh, um, a Queen's Council to look into this. So, it's only uh, so. What about uh, Barry Zhang and uh, Timothy Tong that will be dealt with uh, by the um, DFJ internally? Well, um, Barry Zhang's case too, because uh, for the formal investigation file involving uh, Barry Zhang, it has not reached uh, the DFJ yet. So, would you be asking the CE for uh, advice uh, before you decide on the prosecution? So, when well before the prosecution. Would you be passing on the file to the chief executive for his advice? I don't understand what you said because uh, this is really a strange question because under Article 63 of the Basic Law, the D of J is responsible for criminal prosecution. In the past, uh, both on this, uh, both at this forum or at the AJLS meetings, we have told Ms. Emily Lau that uh, uh, what, on incidents like this, uh, please do not listen to rumors outside. Well, together with uh, Young Ka Hong, uh, senior counsel, we would not be allowing this to happen. And uh, please rest assured that that's not going to happen at all. Mr. Raymond Chen, my question is SJ003, is about the IWG. Well, yes, this working this uh, working group is not taking up too many government resources. It's just uh, $2 million a year. But then they would be sharing other resources uh, with the department and this IWG is working on something that uh, is of high concern to the community. So uh, I think I've already uh, uh, talked to the uh, SJ, and I hope that the IWG would be re would be taking the initiative to report uh, on the progress uh, to this council because uh, there was a bills committee making the request. That's why they once attended uh, the meeting, but then this bills committee is no longer there. So my question for the SJ is. Are there any arrangements for the IWG to report uh, its work progress to this council instead of just uh, uh, waiting for um, uh, special FC meetings before ans uh, answers can be given? And also, in 2015-16, this working group will be um, preparing one or two, one or more uh, consultation documents. So, when will the first uh, consultation paper be available? And upon the study's uh, completion, would it be uh, submitting a study report? And would it be submitted only to the government? And of course, it would be recommending whether or not legislation is necessary, or would you be uh, making it public? And my third question is: the IWG has had seven. Uh, informal meetings, um, meeting doctors, psychiatrists, academic experts, and transgender people. So, can you give us a list of those uh, people and uh, uh, what their expertise is? SJ, thank you, um, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chen, for your question. As to how we communicate with this council, well, um, I can tell Mr. Chen that just yesterday we had. Um, uh, an IWG meeting, and that was also a subject that we discussed yesterday. As Mr. Chen said, we have had seven informal meetings with uh, doctors and experts and so on, and yesterday we also discussed how we would be communicating to this council on the progress of the working group. We haven't come to any conclusion yet. We hope that uh, by the next meeting uh, we would be able to come to a conclusion and then we'll be able to get back to this council as to how we will communicate with you. But then what I can assure Mr. Chen is that we do need we do think that there is a need for such communication. That's why at the meeting yesterday we were already discussing this and we will be coming to a decision uh, later. And you also talk about uh, the number of um, papers which will be prepared and whether or not they will be made public. Well in simple terms, well according to our work plan there will be two main parts. First, uh, legally speaking, how do we deal with the issue of gender recognition, that is um, in the light of the uh, court case, and also upon such recognition, what are the legal implications, whether or not uh, it's about uh, matrimonial courses or estate um, or contract and so on, because in different aspects, there would be legal implications and how we should deal with that. And also in terms of the responsibility and rights, would there be any change? So that's the second aspect of this work. Well, for the first part, uh, we have already done uh, a very substantial part of the work. But then for uh, members outside the government, we are still 
considering whether or not uh, the first part of the study should be released uh, as the first uh, consultation document, would it be a better approach, or should we wait till after we have completed the second part, and then both parts can be made public so that the community will have a complete understanding of the issues involved. So for members of the RWG, whether they are from the government or outside the government, they are all considering this issue. But then what I can say um, in certain terms is that according to our current plan, the report will be made public because we'd like to conduct a public consultation. And our thinking is that whether it's uh, one report or more, we would like to have the consultation report. And then after the consultation, we will then come to the recommendation. Therefore, first of all, the report will be made public. Mr. Chen asked uh, his last question, and that is uh, about the seven meetings. I don't think at this stage I can promise you to do that. I have to respect the people who took part in the meetings. I have to respect their privacy. I think I need to ask them whether they would like the names made public. Uh, made public because apart from experts and doctors, there were people who have gone through sex reassignment surgeries. Now I don't know uh, whether they would like the names made public. I have to respect their privacy, so I cannot answer your question now. I can certainly go back and do follow up and check with the secretariat of the working group. Next, Mr. Charles Mock, I'd like to follow up my question. S J zero three four. Um, I was talking about um, opening up data, and I'd like to cast a wider question, and that is about the access of information. Uh, I have tried to get some information from the DOJ, but it has been very difficult. In the past few months, I have been asking for information about uh, accessing computers without an honest intent, and that is Cap uh, 161, and I was asking about prosecution done making use of that offense. I was asking the Security Bureau. In the end, uh, it gave me a gross number. I asked the DOJ, and I found that, um, in fact, my colleague uh, was communicating with them, and they said that it was very difficult to find the records because the records were not on computer, they said. So is it that uh, you are using outdated equipment, or is it that you are hiding something? Because I have been asking for that for a few months. In January, I raised a motion in the council, and I was saying that maybe you had me waiting because you did not want me to have uh, any ammunition in my hands for that motion. But still today, it seems your colleagues are still digging up the information. and. When I met the CJ, I also asked him the question. But after some discussion, he said that the question should be referred to the DOJ. So you are here, SJ. Can you tell me why it's so difficult to get the information? I was only talking about um, like two dozens of cases every year. I was asking what kind of cases they are, their nature, and whether they were prosecuted together with other charges. Since you were able to give me the gross number, you should be able to tell me the details of the cases. SJ. Thank you for that question. With regard to the information you asked for, well, I did not know about that request, and that is why I was checking with the Director of Public Prosecutions just now, and I asked him whether he knew of that request. But it seems it had not reached our level. Uh, maybe uh, I contacted um, officials of too low a rank. Mr. Mock, now that I know you like to have that information, I will do the follow-up, and we can certainly give you an answer. Unless there is no record. If there is a record, we can certainly give you figures. No, I'm not talking about figures. Let me tell you more, since I have some time and since you have no answer for me today. I don't only want the gross figure, because I already have it. What I want to know is, you know, they can cover a big area. Um, it may be uh, upskirt uh, shooting or selling illegal uh, the code boxes, etc. I'd like to know what kind of cases these are, the nature of the cases, and how many cases were prosecuted solely on this offense, and uh, how many were prosecuted together with other offenses. Because we want to know whether you have abused your position in prosecuting people with that offense, and we want to know uh, the 
severity of the situation. Because if we want to take you to task, we need some uh, basis to do it. So um, the cases have been already um, sentenced. Why is it that uh, your colleague told me there is no record? And of course, the courts said that uh, I would not be able to get the information from them. But everybody agreed that it's up to the DOJ to provide the information. And I'm not only asking for a figure. SJ, thank you for that clarification. If I have not misunderstood you, I understood you, Mr. Mock. You are asking us under what circumstances the DOJ would make use of that um, provision in the law to instigate prosecution. Well, let me just clarify. I think there were just a few thousand, a few dozen cases, and I want to know um, the nature of the cases. And I'm not interested in the personal information of the people involved. I just like to know the nature of the cases. Do not just give me categories because there are just a few dozen cases. I need to know each and every case because there were just uh, a few dozen cases for the entire year. SJ, I will try to do follow up. I will try my very best to give you the information. I understand what you mean. Mr. Martin Liao? Mr. Martin Liao? Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to follow up my question. It's JA015. The uh, Judiciary Administrator answered my question and said that in the coming year, with the coming um, on stream of the additional judicial posts, it is expected that the um, listing time will be shortened. But then because of um, un unforeseen circumstances, it is difficult to quantify um, how much time could be saved. Since you have got seven more judicial posts, and uh, it is to tackle known workload. I'd like to ask what considerations and factors you based on in order to come up with this uh, number of posts and also the relevant posts. I'd like to ask you whether simultaneously you have set an objective of um, shortening the time by how much? SJ, I think the judiciary administrator should answer the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question. First of all, let me explain that actually in 2015-16, we are not asking for additional judicial posts. But then in terms of having more posts, we were talking about 2014-15, and we asked for seven additional judicial posts. And on the 20th of March, um, on at a finance committee meeting, these were supported. Why did we propose to increase the posts? It is because when we review the operation of the course, we found that uh, the biggest pressure was on the appeal court of the uh, high court. Uh, there were not enough posts to take care of appeal cases. Therefore, at the CFI, we were deploying a lot of people to the court of appeal to handle cases. So one of the proposals was, and uh, which was supported, that there should be three more justices of appeal so as to boost the establishment of substantive posts at the appeal court. So does it mean that there is one more division? Yes, exactly. So we can have one more division uh, with three judges. Once we have that kind of establishment, the court of appeal establishment will be boosted. And then we can also deploy more substantive judges of the CFI back to the CFI. And then at the CFI, we now have one more judge. This is because we would like to have more resources so our judges can have more time, overall speaking, to take part in judicial training. This is the uh, rationale behind the proposal. When we made proposals for additional manpower, well, in terms of the waiting time, uh, this is affected by many, many different factors. And we just cannot quantify by how much we can shorten the waiting time after the posts have been added. But maybe members are aware of this. In 2014, with regard to civil cases, through deploying deputy judges, 
we have been able to improve the waiting time. The extensions have been very much shortened. We will try our best to do it, but it is not a science, and so we cannot quantify the figures for you. Thank you. Can I um, ask a follow-up? I'm just asking about the objectives. Um, by how much would you like uh, to shorten the waiting time as an objective? Well, yes. In our report, we have said uh, that the target waiting times should be so and so. We have uh, consulted the committee on uh, or about the users of court time. My questions are SJ06 and 07. Uh, these have to do with expenses and manpower. There are over 500 people uh, responsible for criminal prosecution, and the jump is 7.9 percent or 52.2 million. And the total expenditure will be over 100 million, uh, actually 150 million. In terms of manpower, uh, I think you have not been stingy with the prosecution division. But we can see that in terms of actual operation, as the SJ said at the beginning, that the government would have to be fair and balance every factor. But if you look at prosecutions, it's very slow, or even uh, you don't prosecute the rich and famous. Together with Leung Kwok Hong, I reported to ICAC on uh, Donald Zhang's uh, corrupt activities. The case has been dragging on for over two years, and we have not heard about it. And the seven police officers who beat up a person in a dark corner, there was clear evidence, and yet there was no prosecution. However, the average member of the public, they are prosecuted for minor offenses. A young person who was um, suspected of arson in Shangshui, there was no evidence. There was not even a lighter in his bag, and yet he was locked up in Pig Oak for three weeks. And then you withdrew all prosecution efforts. So um, is it that you have relegated yourselves to be a political bouncer? The 300-odd government council, uh, would they be willing to become the um, cronies and also political bouncers of the Hong Kong communists. I don't know about what is happening. You are showing the Hong Kong public that ever since Andy Zhang and C. Y. Leung assumed posts, the DOJ seems to have taken up the role as an accomplice of the police who are arresting people indiscriminately and also a bouncer under C. Y. Leung. The rich and famous can still be throwing their weight around, and they do not have to respect the rule of law. In the last two years especially, of course, uh, the sovereignty has been resumed for 17 years, but in the last two years in terms of the corruption index and also in terms of the rule of law, uh, we have been doing much worse, and the DOJ has the biggest responsibility. We are giving you more money. There is an increase of 7.9 percent for criminal prosecution. Uh, other departments are not getting as much increase, and people do not have their salaries increased by that margin. So how can you explain to Hong Kong people why have we done so badly in terms of criminal prosecution and the rule of law? Why is it that the average member of the public uh, is prosecuted, but then the rich and famous are left scot-free? SJ. Thank you for Mr. Chen's speech and his question. But I have to solemnly clarify here that the uh, so-called question by Mr. Albert Chen is totally unfounded. And there is absolutely no evidence that uh, his subjective observation is right. No, the young person was imprisoned for three weeks, and in the end, there was no prosecution taken. That is a fact. And Donald Zhang has not been prosecuted after two years. This is a fact, SJ. Open your eyes. Open up your eyes and look at the facts. That's Jay. Uh, uh, Mr. Chen, I hope he will also open his eyes and look at the facts. And that is, we have just completed a very uh, major case involving a very high ranking former official and other people in the business sector. If, if the situation is as painted by Albert Chen that we um, condone what the rich and famous do and oppress the public, then why is it? Uh, that is one way for you to tackle 
the Sun Hong Kai because the Kwok brothers did not listen to the Chinese Communist Party. Just look at the political role and the political prosecution. Uh, can I make a request, please? I hope I can further answer this question because if not, uh, Mr. Albert Chen's remarks would be um, absolutely unfair to the DOJ, especially the prosecution division. I hope I have a chance to clarify to the members of the public. If not, as the SJ, I would not be doing anything fair to the prosecution division. Well, please be very brief. Okay, I'll be brief. First of all, the DOJ is absolutely not any political bouncer. Secondly, in the Occupy movement, um, as you can see about the cases, some cases are still being investigated. There have not been decisions because we have to look at the evidence. So whether it's some um, people who are in support or against uh, the Occupy movement, we have to be fair. Mr. Albert Chen, it's not your time to speak. How do you justify what you have done? Well, I believe that Albert Chen should understand that uh, in every case after the investigation, the investigation file would only be submitted to the DFJ after the completion of investigation, and then we'll consider whether prosecution should be taken out. Well, SJ, I don't think uh, you'll be able to fully uh, explain yourself, so I don't think it's um, necessary for us uh, to allow this to continue. This is not a debate. Next, Lang uh, Hong. Mr. Lang Huat Hong, Mr. Chairman, all right, Secretary, you said that for the seven policemen, well, their files have not reached the DFJ. Is that the case? Is that the case, that their files have not reached you? You have asked your question. All right, Secretary, he has asked the question. Can you repeat that, repeat that again if he, um, he, if he hasn't got it? Sorry, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lang Hong, for your question. Well, just now I was saying that uh, the investigation procedures are that, um, all right, the police would have to conduct the investigation and then the file will have to be submitted to the DFJ. On individual cases, what I can say is that we have just uh, received the file. We have just uh, received the file. That's why our colleagues will still have to look into the relevant evidence. All right, understood. So it's not your fault. Uh, somebody has uh, made a mis has committed a mistake. I've asked this. I put it to the um, CP. All right. Uh, is um, um, for all to see. Obviously, after looking at after seeing the video, you would have known that uh, what they have done. So for people under the CP, they are not able to come to conduct the investigation. But then I think Mr. Albert Chen was right. There was a young person and I visited him at uh, Pig Oak and then the police told him that you will have to plead guilty for uh, burning uh, a, a rubbish bin and then I'll release you. So he was uh, thrown into Pig Oak. So has prosecution been taken out against him? I suppose uh, he has been charged, right? So he has uh, had um, his first appearance in court already. So it's almost like um, the film Saving Private uh, Saving. Uh, private Ryan, and uh, apparently uh, you would have come to the conclusion that the uh, case, the facts of the case were serious. That's why he had to go to Pig Oak. But then for this young kid, he didn't, well, nobody has seen what he has done. So for the seven people around, well, for the seven police officers, uh, we all saw what they had done. So that's uh, a huge discrepancy in terms of the handling of the two cases. Second, well, Donald Zhang was reported, and uh, Liu Meng Hong was also reported on. All right, uh, Liu Meng Hong was already charged. In other words, he has already um, been tried. But then Donald Zhang has not yet uh, got his trial. But then apparently, as I was the one uh, doing the reporting, and yet um, so it was. So the report on Donald Zhang was made earlier. How come um, he was not yet uh, prosecuted? SJ, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Long, for your question. First of all, I have to clarify that there is no um, double standards. It's not right to uh, compare the timing for the 
two cases and say that, uh, well, this one has taken longer and that one has taken shorter. This is not a fair way to judge the case. But all along, our colleagues are in the prosecution's divisions have been adopting the same approach. That is the approach adopted by the prosecution code. And of course, the time required for um, a decision to be taken depends on the um, merits of the case, the um, availability of evidence, whether or not it's about the facts or some legal issues, uh, and also the complexity of the case would also determine whether or not we need to uh, collect evidence uh, outside Hong Kong. And if uh, that's necessary, then we would also have to look at um, areas which might not be entirely within the control of Hong Kong. So there are issues involved which might not be entirely in our hands. Uh, we cannot just say that within a matter of days we will, be a we will have to collect the evidence. So these are the considerations that are involved. In the second round, we have five more members. And because of the time limit, two minutes each. Xin Chong Kai. Thank you. Just now, the SJ, in reply to my question about uh, SJ037, he denied that uh, the increase of 32.1% in expenditure on prosecution has nothing to do with settling the scores uh, after autumn um, uh, or after the incident. All right, uh, if you look at uh, the increase uh, when compared to 2013, just now, you were also reluctant uh, to tell us uh, the basis on which you have come up with this estimate. So I'd like to know, all right, after spring, according to your estimates, how many cases relating to the Occupy movement would be uh, prosecuted? And uh, to go on a bit further, all right, after the investigation has been completed, how many files are with you? So how many cases will be considered for prosecution? Secretary, I believe that Sorry, Chairman. Mr. Sin Chong Kai, thank you for your question. I believe that um, you must have um, heard from the media reports that for the entire Occupy movement and in its related matters, um, a number of arrests have been made by the police, and it amounted to about a 1,000 people being arrested. So for the related investigation reports, they are being sent to the DFJ um, and we are still looking at uh, the individual cases because we can't do that uh, in batches. So we have to look at the individual cases separately. That's why there is no formal figure as to how many cases will um, be prosecuted and how many will not. But then even if there is no prosecution, it doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with those cases. Because after looking at the evidence and the relevant uh, laws, we will then be able to take a decision on whether prosecution is warranted. So we can't say that, uh, well, as you only you have only taken out so many prosecutions, that's why you don't need that much manpower. That's not um, um, really uh, right. Priscilla Lung, all right, uh, you referred to um, many prosecution cases. I've also helped um, a case involving Leung Wai Kun, a former district councillor, because of two votes. Uh, he was involved um, in uh, a court case, and uh, he did not um, rig the votes. But then uh, in terms uh, because of a delay in submitting the uh, consent uh, form, so he was prosecuted. And then subsequently, uh, he had uh, a criminal record uh, recorded against him. So for such uh, irregularities, in fact, uh, in most ca uh, well, there was some, there, there's never been any uh, prosecution. And after him, there was no prosecution either. So as a result, uh, he had to pay some $2 million as legal cost. And you also uh, charge him several hundred uh, thousand dollars uh, as your legal cost. So in terms of uh, such charges, well, I hope that in future cases, whether it has, uh, uh, because, uh, whether it's uh, because of political consideration or whatever. So I hope that you would be treating everybody on equal footing. So uh, on the contrary, apparently you are imposing more hefty sentences on those from the pro-establishment camp. So how come you have to um, brief out the case uh, to an outside council? All right, uh, if it's uh, just a council from the DFJ, even if its uh, remuneration is $70,000, $100,000, this is not really a complicated case. So in the end, he had to shoulder $3 million as uh, his legal cost. I hope that uh, for uh, lawmakers and district councillors involved in such cases, you would be as stringent as ever. 
SJ. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lang, for your question. You talk about uh, treating everybody on an equal footing. Yes, um, all along we've been emphasizing that uh, when it comes to uh, civil or criminal prosecutions, there will be no political consideration in the decision to prosecute. You also refer to the two million plus uh, legal costs. I think uh, part of it has to do with uh, the civil part of the case. Well, it has to do with the election petition procedure. So I'll have to go back and check it, because I don't I don't believe that in the criminal case that uh, it would incur more than two million dollars uh, legal cost. Next, uh, Emily Lau, Chairman, I'd like to put it to the judiciary administrator. In paragraph six of your uh, statement, you quoted uh, the Chief Justice uh, at the opening of the legal year. I was there too. And uh, the Chief Justice said that uh, at the CFI, the recruitment was somewhat difficult. And uh, in view of that, uh, he said that there would be uh, different re reviews, including the terms and conditions of service for judges and also the review uh, on the retirement age of judges. And if the judici judiciary had to um, uh, recruit um, um, unqualified people to depose, uh, then they'd rather leave the position vacant. So I'd like to know, with regard to the review, so has it got to do with the terms and conditions of service, which are making things difficult, and how are you going to improve the situation so that the post could become more attractive, so that high quality people or high caliber people would be attracted to apply? So what is the progress? JA. It should not be the SJ uh, doing, uh, giving the reply. It should be the JA. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Lau. Well, there are two reviews. It talks about um, the conditions of service of judges. Well, on conditions of service with regard to um, benefits, if there can be some revision to the benefits, then I think that would help to attract more high caliber people to become judicial officers. And uh, we are already at a mature stage of that review. We expect that uh, within this year, 2015, we intend to complete the um, study and review, and then we will submit the report to the executive. Second is about uh, the retirement age of judges and judicial officers, and uh, at the CFA, uh, uh, Mr. Justice uh, Tang Cheng is now uh, chairing a working group on that. Mr. Alberto, well, in terms of the rule of law and uh, uh, corruption index, I think we are, well, our ranking is dropping, so it's uh, quite a disgrace. So why has it uh, become so bad? I've already asked this about the Citic Pacific case. All right, our investigation has been going on for six years, and now we've only got one civil uh, prosecution. And then for criminal prosecution, still there is no end in sight. And then in Singapore, there was another case. Uh, and then, um, so they've already released a report after the investigation, and prosecution has taken place, and uh, people have been sentenced to jail. And still, nothing has come about in Hong Kong. That's why we are lagging behind. And also, our chief executive was involved uh, in the UGL case. We are talking about $40, $50 million, and he failed to um, uh, declare. And also for the uh, uh, for the HA and also the UGC, if there is a failure of um, the declaration by a few thousand dollars, then um, the person would be prosecuted uh, for that failure. So looking at the uh, cases, how can the public come to a conclusion that we have been fair to the individuals and that there is justice in our system? SJ. Um, on uh, whether we have a clean government and also the rule of law. Of course, we attach a lot of importance to that. But then um, I don't think what you said can represent that Hong Kong has serious problems in those regards. First, on the case involving Citic Pacific, I'm sure you all know that in the relevant investigation procedures, the investigated parties uh, instituted uh, some legal procedures and uh, there was an appeal and appeals were involved. So the case is still before the Court of Appeal, and uh, before the uh, cases are dealt with by the 
C of A, uh, no action can be taken. So it's not that uh, the police or the enforcement agencies have been dragging their feet. It's that uh, the investigated party has instituted some legal procedures resulting in the whole thing being bogged down. And then Mr. Ho also referred to the case of UGL as the case is being investigated or dealt with by the ICAC and therefore it's not appropriate for us to make any comment on that. But then all in all, what I can say to Mr. Ho and other members as well as the chairman is that the D of J attaches a lot of importance uh, to uh, the rule of law and on cases involving uh, property, we would be investigating them uh, equally. And uh, we have just uh, completed the case involving the former Chief Secretary for Administration. It shows that uh, when it comes to corruption, we have adopted a zero tolerance approach and the whole prosecution process can also show that uh, we, uh, we do have the rule of law. Mr. Dennis Kwok. Okay. Uh, Ms. Sit Ho. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the first part of the question will be asked on behalf of Mr. Lee Chuck Yen. Um, legal education is important, including that for members. SJ, do you have uh, pamphlets that can be distributed to all 70 members to tell them that uh, they should not say anything like the police would arrest people and the judges are letting people free because that hurts the dignity of the judiciary and also the public confidence in the judiciary? Can the SJ? try to do this through some channels and tell lawmakers that they should not be doing this. Chairman, I'd like to follow up on SJ021 on law drafting. Indeed, recent years, uh, whether it be law drafting or law printing or uh, the printing of the text, uh, there have been omissions. Certainly. The drafting itself is problematic. But well, we have bilingual legislation, but we all know that it is very difficult to draft laws in Chinese because of the nature of the language, because the Chinese language uh, does not rely on logic and uh, causal effects. You tell us that there is a pilot scheme that you would get somebody from the law drafting division uh, who will not look at the English but who will just read the Chinese and to see whether the drafting is uh, good enough. I have asked you, I would like to ask you how long that pilot has been going on and when you um, conducted such pilot tests, um, is it that uh, sometimes you saw that the Chinese was not written well and then so what did you do? Would you change the Chinese first and then you try to change the English in um, consequence? Well, since we have already exceeded the time for this session, I will give you one minute and then we'll have to conclude the session. First of all, uh, what members of the council should say and not say, I think it's up to members to decide. Secondly, about law drafting, we will try our very best to make both the Chinese and English text uh, legible and uh, comprehensible. Thank you. Thank you, SJ and your team. The next session will start at 4.50. Thank you very much.